right, good morning. Good morning, and I'll follow with the meet and say it is wonderful to see so many New York Yankees fans today, today, because that's really exciting. Yeah. It's not over, it's right, it's right. So um, I'm really excited to be here today uh, to, uh, and talk about scale and uh, scaling up and, and what that means. You know, I'm one of those people who has the, the LinkedIn profile. When you read it, you have no idea, no concept, or anything of what I've done uh, in 20 years. So I'll try to help you uh, understand the type of clients and the environment that I've worked in. But I really want to talk about scale, and I want to talk about the elephant in the room, which is What's the real difference in contrast between the public sector and the commercial world? And the challenges that we seek in public sector uh, customer sets versus commercial customer sets. So over 20 years, I've seen the downfall of Token Ring, the rise and fall of Fiddy, and the co Ethernet conquering the Earth. Now, who actually knows who the first two technologies were that I mentioned? Hands, hands. OK, good, because <laughs> I'm dating myself. Uh, and over that time, I've seen lots of technology come and go, both in the cyber world and the IT world. And I've seen customers transform around that. Um, and you know, and I, I find that often we, the public sector is pushed to look to the commercial world for the solutions to all their problems. In reality, there's a lot of opportunity for the commercial world to look at the public sector and say, wow, you, know, I, you, you have my problem, but by a million times greater. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that. Uh, over the 20 years, I've worked both with federal, state, local customers, uh, but also commercial customers. I'll tell you a funny story about the, the very few commercial customers I worked with. Uh, I did a vulnerability assessment for a bank, small, small medium-sized bank, very early on in my career. And uh, they had just upgraded their IBM mainframe to a new um, Z-series mainframe. Have you ever seen an IBM mainframe? A new one, they look like kind of a refrigerator. And next to this big, modern-looking refrigerator was this kind of old, crotchety-looking machine that was kind of metal and had a lot of wires coming out of it. The crotchety-looking machine was that they can reload the banking software because the banking software was on punch cards. So they'd modernized, but the banking software itself was still punch cards, and they needed the punch card machine to load the computer. So the concept that somehow they may have some quantum leap in technology ahead of anybody else in the industry was actually more just the new shiny looking machine that you could get support for versus where the actual software code was. So just as an example. I talk about the public sector, I really talk about federal, state, and local, the Defense Department, and other key critical uh, national in critical infrastructure components. And I think it's important to contrast the two. When we think about uh, commercial entities, you know, these days when you think of Google or Amazon or Microsoft, you go, oh yeah, they've got millions of things. But reality is they have millions of transactions versus actually have millions of objects. And if you look at an infrastructure like the Army, for example, and the Army manages three to four million objects within their infrastructure every day. And that far exceeds and eclipses any other type of commercial infrastructure that you would find. And the, and the scale of that problem set basically breaks all technologies. There's no technology off the shelf that will work in that environment without being modified or integrated. Uh, which is important to, to, to take into consideration. Um, the other thing is from a scale from a cyber defense perspective, where you find millions of events per day in a commercial environment, you'll find billions of events uh, just been with one entity, one federal entity. And being able to manage that and process that uh, across the globe and across a set of differing um, missions is, is really important also to take into consideration from a pair and contrast. So at, a, at least you could say the infrastructures are massive, and very diverse, diverse in terms of operating system, diverse in terms of hardware, legacy capability, code, usage, and mission. Um, and, and the other thing you hear a lot about IoT and the Internet of Things. Well, while that's a, a, a revolutionary concept in commercial entities like putting your refrigerator and your microwave on the Internet, I'd say that within the Defense Department, for example, that Internet of Things thing is kind of here now. And when you look at the different systems and components and capabilities that are integrated on those networks, they are really uh, focused on an Internet of Things. It's just not refrigerators and microwaves. Uh, but it is the same problem set, only now. So in some respects, there's a lot that you can look at the public sector infrastructure and reflect upon what's coming in to the rest of our lives in the commercial world. And the other aspect uh, I like to talk about in this area is, is risk management. So in the public sector, I think there's really two key components of risk management. 
and, and why we risk manage. You know, one is to protect our way of life as Americans so that the core systems are there, whether it's Social Security or it's the healthcare system, have to function. And then the Defense Department, it's really about loss of life. So whether you're in the Defense Department or in the intelligence community, you're managing risk to save a life. You're not managing risk um, for, you're managing risk around availability, but it's really about saving lives and enabling forces to protect the nation. And that is a completely different uh, takeaway and a mindset. Um, and just even within a single organization, so I'll give you a story uh, about a defense customer that I had. Same system, different applications running on the same system. Same security requirements, but when you looked at one app, one app was all about the availability of the application. That's all that customer cared about. All they cared about was that that picture and that map was going to be there. Didn't matter if it was right, wrong, indifferent, correct, or incorrect. They just wanted the map. And then another application was about the integrity of the data. And they didn't care if the system was up or down. If it was down, so be it, it was down. But if it was going to be up, then the integrity of the data was going to be at 100%. So just within the one entity, the set of requirements that they're dealing with, although the same, the intent and the mission were completely different from one another, uh, which you might not find in, in other areas. So as we kind of walk through this concept of what it means to scale, I want to kind of go through three specific areas about where I think we have challenges today. First and foremost, most technologies honestly, and most of the processes and how we train people are all about reacting. Reacting to a breach, reacting to a threat, reacting to some event that happens. Technologically, most of the technology is based on something we know, a signature, a pattern. Although we can take those patterns and compare them against something new and find out new information, it's really about being reactive. And so fundamentally, we have to change from a reactive motion into a proactive way, all the way down to how we train the people, how we educate the workforce, to even the key technologies and capabilities we deliver have to be built around a proactive construct. Second main point is, I'll define as, as loosely coupled. Now I think we all accept, and we wouldn't be here if we didn't accept the fact that there is no silver bullet to the problem. This problem encompasses people, processes, and technologies, and offers lots of opportunity to evolve at all points. And so because of that, you wind up with not having any single technological capability that can solve any one problem, and then complicated by the scale of the environment that you're dealing in and the millions of nodes, and you wind up in a situation where you have lots of loosely coupled cyber defense capabilities, whether it's the processes that are loosely coupled, whether it's the technologies that are loosely coupled, and it drives you to not being able to react, going back to point one, and also not being able to be proactive. And while most of today's technology advances and development is really focused at data integration, it's all about if I have data from all these loosely coupled things, if I can pull it together into a database, I can ask it questions, and it's going to give me an answer. And basically, we're asking questions we kind of know the answer to already, but we're asking patterns that we've already seen before. But that's not the same as being able to fully integrate that infrastructure to allow you to react. And using data standards such as like sticks and taxi as an example to share threat information, across these lucid coupled systems, or an emerging standard called OpenC2 to be able to then take that actual information we have and push it to the infrastructure, either in an automated way or some kind of human-enabled way. And so while big data is really great, it doesn't really help you from a reaction standpoint. It doesn't help you get ahead of the curve, and it doesn't help you move quicker. It just helps you tell you things that either you knew or questions you wanted to ask, and it gave you an answer, and you aggregated that across the complete infrastructure. And that, so based on that, then, you know, there's some construct that gets us to, from a limited functionality state where we are today, I'd say, and limited in the sense of that, in, in, from a temporal standpoint of how quickly we can react to a threat, from a process perspective, how quickly when we react to that threat, we're able to inform and correct, uh, and then move into a point where we really are operating at scale, and having the ability to take innovations that occur rapidly, like some new capability and technology you want to integrate into the environment, integrate into the processes right away. You have the ability to do that regardless of where it comes from, who created, and who innovated the technology. And it's not about a single capability or a single technology set. So it's really about being able to rapidly evolve in a, in a reasonable amount of time. Um, 
and being proactive about it and advancing and in investing in technologies like artificial intelligence and cognition, not to replace the human, not to replace the operator, but to provide you the opportunity to augment the human operators and really move them from a state of reaction today, where it's like a, almost a playbook mindset, to a point where you actually are looking at the unknown. You're, you're, you're going into the, into the abyss of, okay, these are questions I know I have answers to, to, wow, can the system really tell me something that I would have never thought about before? Um, and, and a lot of this then comes down to workforce and how we train our workforce, whether it's a user, or as Amit said, you can't throw the users out, so you have to make them better. And I think uh, many organizations do like spear phishing type testing where you go out and somebody sends you an email. I will admit the first spear phishing activity that Northrop Grumman did, the test, I failed the first test. <laughs> It's very hard to say that, but I did fail the first test. And I've not lived it down in all the years that they've done that. Every time I see somebody from our organization, they remind you, say, didn't you fail that first spear phishing test? But the point is that, although an organization might fail, today we react. We go, okay, you failed, let's get you some training. But over time, you migrate that user population from reacting to saying, hmm, this doesn't look right, it doesn't feel right, why don't I just delete it rather than opening, opening or thinking about it? From a cyber defender standpoint, it's the same thing. We have to move away from, here's a checklist, and here I'm an incident handler, and I get this alert, and I'm going to go do A, B, C, and D, and my job's done, and somebody else is going to take care of it, to really pushing that part of the population into uh, more deep thought and give them tools and technologies and capabilities that allow them to think like that, and then have a set of command and control functions that allow you to rapidly uh, react. And it, it really becomes about workforce. And so I, I'm, uh, I'm going to make an ask of everybody in the room relative to workforce and really getting more people into this market segment. And that's about mentoring. And so if you don't have a, a young woman or a young man that you're, you're mentoring to try to get into this industry, then when the first thing, the only thing you should do today when you leave is go find somebody to mentor and encourage them to get into, the, into this market. Or if a, a veteran, if you know of a veteran, that's coming out of the service that's looking for a new career and wants to make an adjustment. You've got to go seek the people and bring them into the industry and help inspire them. And that would be my, my ask of the day. But at the end, it's really about the future of cyberspace depends on how well, as a nation, we can scale. How well we can scale our people, how well we can scale our technology, and how we can advance ourselves beyond where we are today, which is getting out of the mode of, I like to react, I like to pay, buy capability and integrate them into my environment, but not really understand how they integrate into the enterprise and how I go from a limited functionality environment into a full, up, scalable enterprise at the scale of government, which is not the same uh, we see in other markets, and that really understand and appreciate the challenges associated with doing that. So thank everybody for your time, and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.